Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Keep it time for us now to have a conversation. And we're talking about the World Environment Day. There's so much to talk about. But then again, in the time we have, we'll manage um, what we can. Nathaniel, uh, that is Daniel Wanjoki, not Nathaniel, is the lead scientist at EcoSave Africa and actually the founder of EcoSave Africa. He was a one uh, among the organizers of the national event, the World Environment Day, that was held in Embu. We also have Anthony Sure, the head of carbon projects financing at Vast. Carbon. I think it is important to begin this conversation from the aspect of policy and what needs to be done, um, Daniel, owing to the fact that you're in the National Steering Committee that was planning this the World Environment Day and probably um, aware of what policies and initi initiatives need to be taken by the national government and also at the international level to address climate change effectively. Thank you. Mm. JJ, for having us, for having me there today. Yes. Uh, it is true that... Uh, in 1972, the world came together and decided that the environment requires a day where everybody can uh, commemorate the issues affecting the environment mm -hmm. all over the world. And that is the same meeting, the same sitting that created UNEP. So it is something that should tell us that it was important that we have UNEP and that you have what, the mm. World Environment Day. Mm. Now, come forward to today. We normally commemorate this day, this day on the uh, 5th of June, and it has happened ever since 1972. Mm -hmm. However, when you look at um, how much policy we have uh, generated around the environment space, there's a lot of, um, it's quite wish-wash. <laughs> it is not, uh, okay. I would, I would say with the Indep light here in Kenya, with Kenya being so uh, work on matters and development, we seem to fail just at the moment when we, the world needs us. For example, on the, on the theme, mm. which was um, land restoration, desertification and drought. Okay, I would put it the other way around. Mm. I would say drought, desertification, and, and then the land restoration. Land restoration. Mm. I would say that we've not, it's not in us. We've seen our land get eloded, uh, cleared by um, floods. We have seen this country actually has lost more than 50,000 hectares in Mount Kenya to an invasive weed. So when you're talking about land restoration, don't just think about Mumanyoko or Ndongo, where mm. soil erosion is happening. Mm. It is that some of our land is being taken over by invasive weeds. You've seen around, yeah, a tree that has been completely, been dead that used as a, as a carbon sink mm. by a weed called Doda, mm. the weed that looks like spaghetti. And what have we done? Nothing. Last week, the Governor Kajedo County called for a concerted effort to eradicate a certain weed called apomia. Mm. It is, if you're driving or um, going to Mombasa by SGR, both sides of the road have white flowers. Mm. And that area where that vegetation is growing, there's no, there's no grass that grows on, under that. Mm. So you're actually losing land as you watch and uh, there's nothing being done to change that. That's why I'm saying... Policies are wishy-washy. Yeah. So from where you stand, yeah. um, do we have any watertight policies to address the climate change effectively, or you will agree with Wanjoki, it's wishy-washy? Yeah, um, for me, I say it's a bittersweet moment. Okay. As much as I, I concur with some of the aspects that he has brought mm. out, I think if you compare our country with the rest of the continent, uh, and also just generally the globe, uh, we've made quite some significant process, mm -hmm. uh, progress over the last couple of months, uh, especially in terms of uh, mobilizing climate finance and championing for you know, climate finance being channeled mm -hmm. to Africa. Mm -hmm. We saw we hosted the inaugural Africa Climate Summit in September last year, and that just shows you know, how proactive even the current government is in terms of establishing Kenya as that center for mobilizing this climate finance because all these adverse effects you're experiencing around us, uh, for you to uh, implement mitigation measures or even uh, adaptation measures around that, uh, there is a need for significant financing. And I think uh, with the you know, Carbon Markets Act and you saw uh, the climate change bill from a, a bit uh, some time back, mm. there's definitely uh, intention in terms of building the right sort of policy framework so that uh, 
when you know to channel this finance uh, global uh, let's say investors are feeling comfortable that Kenya is a solid you know uh, economy that I want to invest in and not just invest in the tangible assets we think about but also the climate assets which mm. uh, with carbon trading and you know is becoming a reality now all right mm. uh, tree planting is one of the policies adopted by this government 15 billion uh, trees in the next um, 10 years mm. is that enough is it a starting point I've not uh, done the calculations and seen how much 15,000 15, 15 billion, billion trees would cover in Kenya mm. but I'm sure the world over here has more than 4 trillion uh, trees. So I don't know what percentage of Kenya that is, <laughs> uh, what land mass contribution that is to uh, Kenya makes. I would say that is still very little. Mm. And uh, especially because our northeastern has already been taken over by, okay, we had the, the Mathenga tree, which is not bad mm -hmm. because it is replacing some vegetation. Mm. Why don't we plant trees? in those areas without even counting the 15 billion must be a very small figure when it's made to look like uh, you are planting 350 trees is enough mm. there could be need for us to plant trees without counting and we don't restrict it to just our land mm. we should plant trees anywhere along the highways anywhere in any open space that that is the only way where we can contribute because the land mass of kenya is less than uh, two percent mm. uh, if i'm very generous mm. of the world <laughs> mass so if 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 i gave you a place of two percent you would not even feel it yeah so equally if kenya did three from border to border mm. it would still be a very small impact we are not driving the, the global agenda mm. and the kenya being okay UNEP being in kenya we should be driving tree growing in Somalia, in Sudan, in every other open space. That is the only way we can say we are actually changing, mm. uh, restoring our lands and uh, stopping uh, the certification. Interesting because um, he mentions the Madenge plant. Mm. Considering again the fact that almost three quarters of the country now is almost being um, mm. a desert question is, do you think we're taking enough steps to protect vulnerable communities that are either disproportionately accept, uh, you know, affected by um, climate change, as it were? Yeah, um, on that end, I think we're not doing enough. <laughs> uh, there's a lot more to be done. And uh, relying on you know, government coffers to fund such programs is one of the key reasons why barely any progress has been made on that, on that front. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think even with the work with the Carbon, we've been provident advocates for you know seeking alternative sources of funding that can go be channeled towards such initiatives um, and c carbon financing is one of those things uh, so I believe as much as you know the intentions and all the commitments are well intentioned uh, well intentioned and well placed uh, there's still a need for sort of a multi-stakeholder approach where we're not solely you know relying on the government to set up the plans and actually implement them but there's a sort of a collaboration of different stakeholders uh, to actually you know incentivize the you know uh, support for these communities and also ensure that their rights are taken care of uh, because even if you look in the uh, carbon market side of things uh, as much there's been quite some blowback on some projects where you find that uh, you're, you know, you're in, in involving yourself in a um, green initiative, whether it's tree planting or uh, it can be any community-based sort of activity, and you find that once the revenue comes in, uh, the a community are not able to you know, get an equitable share that's actually going to impact them on the ground. Mm. And so even as uh, I think, to just uh, brief, briefly put my thoughts together on that, uh, I think there's we have, we're not doing enough in the sense that there's, uh, there's barely any effort that's been put to make it a multi-stakeholder problem as opposed to just that problem we hear about on the news and never hear about it until the next time it's covered. Quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, this semblance of effort by um, this administration towards addressing climate change. Uh, but again, as you have mentioned, our neighbors probably are also uh, not applying as much effort to probably boost you know, Kenya's efforts in the region. And the question is, what are the consequences of inaction by, let's say, our neighbors or even a government? Well, the, it's, um, it's very dire. We would not like to imagine how it would be if we had... We recently had three years of mm. very poor info. Mm -hmm. Man, many areas of um, Narok, Kajiado, 
Taita Taveta were completely devastated. And uh, our natural, natural resources, like the Savo National Park, lost mm. a lot of uh, animals. In Kajedo, for example, we have uh, some figures about 350,000 animals died. Some of them had migrated to other counties, but the, the, the devastation was quite clear. So we would not wish to imagine a situation where the current situation where we had six seasons, that is about three years of low rainfall, mm. can happen for another five years. For example, when that happened, uh, the whole country did not have, have food. How, what do what do we do? We we started looking for food outside the country. We, our budget support for food and um, imports was not enough, and everybody felt it. Mm. We actually voted on the promise that we are going to get food, cheaper food that is uh, cheaper. Ugari. So it is kind of quite uh, unimaginable what would happen if it went that way, mm. but. Considering that we are only doing tree planting here in Kenya and maybe not promoting the same in other countries, we might actually get into that situation mm. because climate change is not a localized phenomenon. We, we've had rain, uh, flooding in uh, Dubai, we have flooding in Brazil. So, and, a, and a few of our countries, our neighbor is actually suffering drought as we speak. Yeah, that's true. So it's uh, not uh, something that we could actually wish away. All right. Correct. Renewable energy sources. Mm -hmm. And what role they play in combating climate change as we wind up? Yes. So I think uh, we, as much as we've seen recently, a lot of you know steam going towards uh, uh, decarbonisation, mm. and uh, the key aspect that comes that brought about the problem to begin with is you know burning of fossil fuels or you know or biomass. And so uh, with renewable energy, uh, it's coming as an alternative, and not just in one way saying, "Oh, my, you know, my." Uh, power supply is not using diesel generators, but they're using geothermal, as they say, uh, the case here. It goes beyond that. It also goes to how we are you know, traveling. Immobility is, is, is also something that uh, has been pushed. Uh, we've been seeing, I think, e-border borders all over mm -hmm. Nairobi, if you're anywhere in Nairobi. And I think that's, that's a, one of the trends that renewable energy also supports because uh, uh, it contributes, first of all, towards the decarbonization uh, aspect. And also, at the same time, um, as much as in Kenya we may take it for granted the fact that our grid is almost perfectly clean, the fact that most of our energy is from um, renewable sources, at least 90%, um, it's, it's definitely not the case uh, all over the globe. And also generally, even within the country, there are certain things that we do, let's say, for example, cooking, that uh, um, transitioning to electric cooking could actually uh, be a, a better alternative. And you've seen, I think, with uh, some of the initiatives we've been working with, with KPLC and Picana Power, there's an initiative where they're basically going around communities and spreading awareness on, on electric cooking yeah. and trying to drive the fact that it's affordable and it's not, um, it's not far removed from your alternative, which is uh, costly and at the same time also to your health in the long term, it's also quite costly. Mm. Yes. You're the scientist. I want to give each one of you um, a minute. And the question is, we have celebrated World um, Environment Day and the lessons we have learned. How do we move from here in less than a minute? We're joking, starting with you. I would, I would wish to say that uh, we need, to, as we talk about decarbonization, land restoration, drought mitigation, and uh, uh, even uh, as we restore land, because this is uh, the decade of uh, land restoration, mm. we need to actually proactively move out. He has monies that can be used to plant trees uh, anywhere in this country. We can do avocados if it is, not, if it is possible. <laughs> and harvest the fruit and also maintain the tree. The tree uh -huh. should earn the farmer carbon credits. That's what we encourage a farmer to plant uh, mangoes or avocados and not brew gum. Fruit trees? Fruit tree, okay. because it will always be there. Nobody will cut a fruit tree unless it is uh, get, got into its uh, head of life. And uh, I know avocados have been planted since 1930 in Kitare, and they are still standing. So you plant such trees, you should be rewarded. And every year, even before you start harvesting, you should be getting something. That is uh, what I would propose. Now on the aspect of uh, our waste management systems, most of our waste uh, combined in the towns and the residential areas and the schools generate a lot of methane gas, mm. which is a worse option 
when it comes to decarbonization, methane gas it has a more than 28 times more global warming potential than carbon, carbon dioxide. So why would we allow our toilets, our school, uh, our piggeries, our dairy farms to generate methane gas? Mm. That's why uh, Ecosave has come up with a solution for such. Which uh, is eco-treat. Eco-treat with digestion, which is perfect for that job, okay. to eliminate carbon uh, methane gas. Mm. And where possible, projects funded that can be funded for schools to do methane gas mm. because they have waste from the toilet. Mm. Let's not think about that. Uh, that waste is uh, contaminated, the gas is contaminated, mm -hmm. but encourage that people can use that as a source of zero carbon. Because this, uh, the carbon from the methane gas from waste is actually what is already in the environment. Okay. So it's a zero option, zero uh, addition to the environment. All right. Uh, your one minute starts now. Moving forward. Yes. Um, I think to echo a point I made earlier, I'll, in brief, uh, is one thing I'd like to see happening, and with something we're active mm -hmm. personally in my own personal mm -hmm. capacity, we're mm -hmm. working towards, mm -hmm. uh, has been embracing this multi-stakeholder approach towards some of these challenges. All these mitigation and adaptation measures I've mentioned, uh, tree planting, uh, clean cooking, immobility, um, all this cannot solely be left up to the government. So there's a need for uh, multi-stakeholder involvement. And for example, in our case, uh, carbon finance has been proven to be uh, um, a sort of uh, a good addition that can make some of these initiatives sustainable. Uh, because at the end of the day, as you said, with the example on the uh, farmer, whereby your, you know, your incentive is to actually keep your trees there because there's this you know, uh, financial incentive that comes at the very end. And so uh, one thing that I think we should do different and I'm pushing on my, on my own is is the embracing of alternative financing and particularly uh, carbon finance as a way to support this mitigation and adaptation uh, commitment. All right. Yeah. Alternative okay. financing yeah. um, from Anthony Suri and according to Wanjuki, plant fruit trees and again, of course, adapt that strategy yeah. of removing methane gas um, from the air. You can contact Wanjuki, obviously, for uh, the product he talks about that eliminates methane gas from um, the environment. Thank you, both of you, uh, mm -hmm. for joining us. And we'll continue engaging you because clearly these conversations will be with us for a long time. Daniel Wenjoke, the lead scientist at EcoSave Africa and the founder of EcoSave Africa, Anthony Sure, the head of carbon projects financing at Verse Carbon. Thank you for joining us. This is where we put a cup on Prime Edition this Wednesday. God bless you. Have a good night and see you around. Thank you.